Hello and welcome to the ECE 102 lesson on engineering career. You are in an introductory engineering class, so it's useful to have a broad perspective of what options await you for engineering fields and organizations, as well as what skills you are expected to have. Let's begin by defining engineering. Former President of the United States, Herbert Hoover, defined engineering as the job of clothing the bare bones of science with life, comfort, and hope. I think this is an excellent definition because it cuts straight to the heart of engineering. We are here to provide real people with products and services that they need to make their lives better. This differs from the common stereotype of engineers working away at a spreadsheet in a cubicle somewhere. Our work is not isolated, but it impacts lives. Legendary engineering instructor Cody Anderson, I mean that as a joke, provides a more straightforward definition, figuring out real-world problems by applying science. Firstly, we are problem solvers. We establish a goal and commit to designing a solution. The solution we develop may be completely new, a small adaptation of an old idea, or simply finding an already existing tool for the job. This requires understanding of the field, diligence, and creativity. Secondly, these should be real-world problems. Another common stereotype pictures engineers out in their garage building a contraption that no one would use, maybe a lawnmower that flies. I would call those people tinkerers. Now, that's not to say there's anything wrong with tinkering. You can learn a lot through it. But unless you are working on a solution to a true problem, you are not doing engineering. Thirdly, we do this by applying science. You could also add math to this statement. My wife solves real world problems all the time as she cares for our children. It takes impressive creativity to get them to stop arguing over a toy sometimes. But that's not engineering because it doesn't apply science. The job of a scientist is to observe the world and establish relationships that explain why things behave the way they do. The job of an engineer is to take what scientists have discovered and apply them to serve people. This loops us back again to Herbert Hoover's definition. This next slide provides more specifics that underlie those broad definitions. Engineers apply science and mathematics to design, develop, test, and supervise. We often picture engineers doing the first two bullets, design and develop, but also critically important are the last two, test and supervise. We need engineers committed to supervising other engineers to make sure all the pieces fit together. An easy example of this is the design of an airplane. The aerospace engineer designs the shape of the wing. The mechanical engineer designs the pistons that make the wing flap go up or down. The electrical engineer designs the wiring to ensure control of the flap. And the industrial engineer, or some other supervisory title, makes sure all of these engineers communicate with each other. We also need engineers that test the designs of others. It is critically important that the person who makes the prototype is not the same person who tests it. Why? Because that design is their baby. They poured countless hours into developing it. We need objective eyes to ensure that a design is safe and reliable. And as you see in the bottom half of the slide, safety and reliability are two of the key considerations of a design. The others are efficiency and cost. It is impossible for any design to be completely efficient, completely reliable, completely safe, and cost very little. Trade-offs always need to be made. This is why a commitment to ethics is vital, as we'll discuss in a later worksheet. Regardless of what level is achieved for each of these four criteria, all of them need to be considered. What type of engineer do you want to be? Well, there are many options. The four main branches are mechanical, chemical, civil, and electrical. Some folks will argue that computer systems is separate from electrical and should be on the list as well. 
Others will suggest that industrial engineering or engineering management should also be on the list. The point is that there is an ongoing discussion and reclassification of what engineers do. This is why I'm actually pleased to reference Wikipedia on this point. Wikipedia is a source that is constantly changing, and so it may be a better representation than other sources of the fields of engineering at any point in time. What I like about this page is that it organizes by primary branches, chemical, civil, etc., then by subdiscipline, then by specialties. For example, under civil we see structural engineering, and under that we see earthquake engineering. But wait, doesn't that sound like it falls under geotechnical engineering? Sure, it could. And that reinforces my earlier point, that this is an ongoing discussion without clear boundaries. As students, here are a couple of big takeaways from this idea. First, your work as an engineer will surely be interdisciplinary. You will need to communicate with and work with other types of engineers. No significant project fits neatly into one little silo. Secondly, you will not learn everything you need for your future job in college. Your major will be under some broad term, like mechanical engineering or aerospace engineering. Then you'll be hired by a company that gives you a project that is one little corner of that broad field. Then you will need to learn new science, new software, new workflows as you are on the job. So don't sit back and hope that we'll teach you everything you need to know. We won't. Be prepared to keep learning. One piece of good news is that there are engineering organizations or societies that can provide support in specific specialties. This slide here is a short list of some societies available in the U.S. My favorite is way down at the bottom, the Tire Society. Am I myself really interested in tires? No, not really. But am I glad somebody is? Absolutely. It's amazing how long car tires hold up safely, even in this Arizona heat. It is not hard to find an engineering organization in your field. Open up Google and search for civil engineering or the like, and you'll see options pop up. But what is the point of these societies? This slide gives a good summary. Services include putting on conferences, publishing technical reports or journals, offering short courses on high demand subjects, advising governments on policies, and creating codes or standards to ensure quality products in their field. The last bullet is the reason most students join a society, networking. It is useful to know people in the field before you graduate so that you can have a clearer path to a job when you graduate. But the networking doesn't stop there. While working on a project, you may run into some issues. Reach out to other members of the society and see if they can help. This next slide summarizes the skills you are expected to have upon graduation, according to ABET. Why should you care what ABET thinks? Because they are the accreditation board for engineering and technology. They are the ones who assess college programs and determine whether they are teaching students efficiently. When you transfer to university, make sure that any program you enroll in is ABET accredited. If it's not, then your degree won't mean much. The expected student outcomes are listed here. Take a minute to read through this list and ask yourself, how many of these are hard skills? In other words, how many of them require technical skills like applying math or software? Okay, I'll pause while you consider. In my opinion, only two of these bullets encapsulate hard skills, apply design, and develop experiments. All the rest are more soft skills, like identify problems, communicate effectively, and learn continuously. This might be surprising to you. The primary job of engineers is not simply to crunch numbers or memorize physics formulas. One awesome benefit of an engineering degree is that these skills are desirable in almost any field, 
engineering or not. So if you graduate and then change your mind as to what job you want to work, you will have a lot of doors open to you. The last slide in this presentation is simply the Engineer's Creed, as established by the National Society of Professional Engineers. Many new engineers take part in a ceremony through the Order of Engineers where they make this statement. In a sense, it is similar to the Hippocratic Oath taken by medical doctors. It is a great way to summarize what it is you are signing up for as an engineer. It reads, as a professional engineer, I dedicate my professional knowledge to the advancement and betterment of public health, safety, and welfare. I pledge to give the utmost of performance, to participate in none but honest enterprise, to live and work according to the highest standards of professional conduct, to place service before profit, the honor and standing of my profession before personal advantage, and the public welfare above all other considerations. In humility, I make this pledge. I hope this helps set your perspective on what an important calling your degree in engineering may lead you to.